Hey guys, in today's video I'm excited to present to you one of the most fascinating and complex endgames in the history of Tournament Scrabble. I'm especially excited because it was taken from one of my own games, which I played at a tournament held this past December in Charlottesville, Virginia. My opponent in this game was David Weisberg, another very strong and experienced expert, and this was the situation. I just played off two of my vowels making the word OI for six points on the 11th row, which emptied the bag. So in this position, it's David's turn. He's down by 17 points, and he's got the seven tiles you see below. A-A-D-G-H-I-T. And he knows from tracking that I have six tiles left, five of which are vowels. As you can see on the right, I have an A, three E's, a U, and an L as my only consonant. So if we take a look at this board, the first thing we'll notice is that it is extremely closed. And in particular, it is very, very much confined to the right-hand side. If I draw a line right down the middle of the board, down the H column, you'll see that the vast majority of the letters are all concentrated on the right-hand side of the board. So what that means is it's going to be very difficult to access the entire left-hand side of the board to the left of this pink line I've just drawn here, which severely limits options for both David and myself. Now, one very common strategy in Scrabble endgames is to try to use all of your tiles or play out as quickly as possible. The idea behind this is that if you can do that, you'll deprive your opponent of additional turns to try to score more points, and also hopefully catch them with unplayed tiles on their rack, earning a bonus. And that's exactly what David tried to do in this game. He played the word Aga, A-G-H-A, on row 14, forming the two-order word Ab for 16 points. This brought him to within one point of me, I'm now up 375 to 374, and it was my turn now in this position. And Aga looks like a very, very good play on David's part. The idea, as I said, is he's trying to use all of his tiles as quickly as possible, and on the board, this constrained, playing four tiles at the same time is pretty good. Not only that, he saves a D, an I, and a T, and DIT is a valid three-letter word, and he's threatening to play DIT in two spots now, either at 13C, right here, making the two-letter word of TA, or at 15C, right here, making the two-letter word of AT. So now the question I need to ask myself is, can I score enough points that even if David goes out next turn, I can still win the game? And if the answer to that is no, then I need to ask myself whether I can block David from going out. And it turns out the answer to the first question is indeed no. My highest scoring play would be to simply drop my U in this sneaky spot between the Y, O, and the R, making the word your for 14 points. If I do that, then David can simply go out, as I mentioned before, with dit and ta for 10 points. And now I'm still up 5, but the problem is I have 5 points on my rack, and David's going to get 5 times 2, or 10, so once I pass, David would win the game by 5, 394 to 389. So if we go back a turn here when I played your, it's also worth mentioning I can try to get rid of more tiles than that with something like a Lee over here for 7, with the idea that once David goes out, he's going to get fewer bonus points, because now I only have two tiles left, but that's still not enough. He can actually play Dit here now for an additional point, because T-A-E T -A -E is a valid word, and he's of course going to go out, he's already up by three, he gets four more points from my E and my U, and he wins the game by seven. So, what that means for me is if I want to win this game, I absolutely must stop David from going out on his next turn. This is a lot easier said than done, because as I mentioned before, he's threatening to play Dit not only above, but also below the A in Aga. As we just saw, if I try to play something on the 15th row ending in an E, such as a Lee, this doesn't work because he simply hooks AE to make TAE and plays DIT there to go out and wins the game. Also, I can't give him an E or an A to work with in open space because both DITA and DITE are valid. So for instance, if I try to block with AA here, that doesn't work because then he just goes out with DITA to that A. Or if I try to play EAU, that doesn't work because he just plays DITE or TIED to that E. So there's a very limited set of things I can do that actually stop David from going out. And there's an even more limited set of things I can do that stop David from going out in a way that also allows me to score enough points and get rid of enough tiles to win the game. It turns out there's only one such play, and thankfully I did find it in the game. It's playing Lee for six points, forming AA. Now you might wonder, why didn't I play it over here for eight points? This scores two more points, and that first also seems to block David's out. Well, the problem is, this word takes the front eye hook for Ilya, so if I did this, David would just play Dit and Ilya going out and winning the game instantly. So I had to play it over here, sacrificing two points. David responded with his best play in this position, playing T-I and Ilya for eight points. And here he actually takes a one-point lead, and he has just a D left, so he's going to be playing out for eight points with Dues next turn at J10 right here. And I can't stop him from doing that, so my best option is to simply net as much as possible, and the best way to do that is to score 14 points by dropping my U 
with Yor. So here I take a 13 point lead. David, of course, goes out as planned for eight points, bringing the score to within five. And he does get four bonus points for my two unplayed E's. So the game ends 395 to 394 for me in a very, very intense one point victory. Now, both of us were pretty low on time by the time we even got to the end game, and we both finished with just a couple of seconds on our clock. So we certainly didn't have time during the game on either of our sides for an exhaustive analysis of such a complicated endgame. And naturally, once the game ended, the question we asked ourselves is, going back to the original position where David played Aga, was there any way he could have played something that guaranteed him a win or maybe a tie? We looked at several options for David, focusing mostly on plays from the C and Crispist, such as Chat or Chad, since these plays score pretty well and also open some future possibilities on the left-hand side of the board but we weren't able to find anything that looked like it would clearly result in a tie or a win for him. We had to pretty soon stop our analysis and start our next games, but we both knew that we probably hadn't done this endgame justice since it was so complicated, so the first thing I did when I got back to my hotel room that night was plug this position into the computer program Quackle and see what we might have missed. Now, when I plugged this position into Quackle's championship player, the results, which I've copied on the right-hand side of my screen, were absolutely astounding. Let me explain what's going on here. The two most important columns are win percentage and valuation. Win percentage in an endgame can be one of only three things. It can be 0%, which means you're going to lose, 50%, which means the game's going to end in a tie, or 100%, which means you're going to win. Valuation means how much you gain or lose relative to your opponent throughout the entire endgame sequence starting with that play. As an example, let's take a look at the actual play David made in the game, which once again was Aga and Ab. Now, David starts out this position down 17 points, and we see that Quackle gives this play a valuation of 16 points. So that would suggest when all is said and done, David will lose this game by a single point since 17 minus 16 is 1. And that is indeed consistent with our earlier analysis where we saw I did indeed win this game by one point after we both played an optimal endgame following Aga. And it turns out there are several other plays David could have made that would have resulted in an extremely close finish. Quackle finds three plays, including Aga, that would result in a one-point loss for him, three more plays that would result in a two-point loss, and a single play, and a truly bizarre one, that would have resulted in a tie. Now, this video would probably be like two hours long if I talked about every single one of these plays and every single one of the sequences that could arise from these plays, so I want to focus on just a couple of them. And the first one I want to talk about is the seemingly bizarre play Quackle finds and claims is the only way for David to tie this position, namely Cad from the Seat and Crispist for 8 points. Now, why is this play so bizarre looking? Well, several reasons. Reason number one, he only gets rid of two tiles. As I mentioned earlier, generally in endgames you want to try to play out as soon as possible, and getting rid of only two tiles is not going to help David do that, and he also keeps, as you can see, A-G-H-I-T, on his rack, which does not form any possible outplays. Number two, he only scores eight points. He's still down nine points after this play, whereas his play of Aga we looked at earlier scores double as many points. It scores 16 points. And number three, it gives back a lot of counterplay to me. Cad takes a back E to make Cade, and I have three E's, and it also allows me to make several overlap plays. So it seems like an absolutely bizarre play. How does this tie? The idea behind CAD is really hard to grasp or explain. After all, as I said before, it doesn't really seem to serve a purpose. It doesn't score a lot of points, it doesn't really have a threat for the next turn, and it seems to give me a lot of counterplay. So why is this a good play? And looking at Quackle's evaluation for me on the next turn only raises more questions than answers. As you can see on the right, Quackle now finds four distinct plays for me that can tie in response to CAD. There are no wins and, of course, a whole lot of losses, but there are four different plays that all result in a tie, which is just truly wild. Now, again, I could probably spend an hour going over all of these different variations in detail, but I'll just show you the main lines of each of these four possible moves I could make that result in a tie. The first one on the list is the rather bizarre move of simply just dropping an E for M for five points. After this, David absolutely must respond with Git and Kadi for 11, saving AH. I have several responses here that tie, one of which is to play Agu through this G. There's also stuff like Egal and Aglu through that G. Really any four-letter word through the G in that spot ties. And after this, finally, David goes out with Ah and Had, resulting in a 393 to 393 tie after I pass. Now let's go back to the original position. Instead of M, I can also respond with Lee and Cade for 13 points. After this, David's only response that preserves the tie is the rather bizarre-looking it for 10 points, forming L, I, and E, T. 
The main idea with this is making sure I can't go out with O, E, A, U next turn, hooking the A onto a Lee, or with any other hooks that David's play forms. My best play is to simply drop a U for 14 with Yor, and then finally David goes out with Hag, forming a Lee and Git, so his last play was also sort of a setup for himself on the next turn, and after I pass, the game ends in a 402 to 402 tie. We still have two more variations to look at. Another possibility for me, as we see on the right, is to play a Lee immediately instead of just Lee, scoring 15 points. This threatens to go out with O through the A and a Lee, as well as Le, L-E-U, from the L and a Lee. It's worth noting that David can play out here. He can play a light, but that would only be 11 points, bringing him to 377. He gets four more from my unplayed E and U, and he would still lose by 9, 390 to 381 if he were to go out. So his best play is not to go out. Instead, he absolutely must respond with hat in this spot. That is his only move that ties. Everything else loses. The idea is he blocks both of my outs without giving me another one. My best play is once again Yor for 14, and then he can go out either with Gat and Gi for 13, or Gi and Ahi for 13. It doesn't matter. And then once again, after I pass, the game ends in a tie, this time at 404 to 404. But there's one more. If we go back to the original position, I can also play a Lee in this spot and tie the game. In this case, David once again has only a single move that ties. This time it is Ha making Had and Al for 21. He takes a one-point lead. I can't go out, so once again I drop my U for 14. And he responds with Gite and Hat for 11 points, going out, and yet again, the game ends in a tie at 400 points apiece. So, truly incredible stuff. Once again, after David's play of CAD, there are four completely different plays I can make that tie the game. I have nothing that wins, which is just remarkable. I mean, I don't know how you possibly see this. Like, none of these variations are obvious. And again, there are many other lines that look like maybe they should potentially win for me, but they don't. I could spend a very long time going through all of them, but... I only have so long I want to make this video, so I will let you guys determine why none of my other possible plays tie, and why, after each of my plays, David seems to only have one possible response that preserves the tie. In any case, though, I have to imagine in a real game it would be almost humanly impossible to generate all of these variations and calculate them precisely after CAD, and let alone just see CAD in the first place. Again, it's a play that really just doesn't make sense, and even now looking at it, I've spent hours just looking at this position between the analysis and prepping this video, and I still just don't really understand. How do you come up with a play like Cat in the first place? Again, it just doesn't really seem like it has any threats or any clear ideas, and it seems at first to help me on low tiles more than it helps David. So just a completely paradoxical play that just really doesn't seem to have any purpose. It really reminds me a lot, honestly, of chess and some of the engine moves that Stockfish and other top chess engines find. Like, they don't really seem to have a purpose that's obvious to humans, but yet they just miraculously seem to work. And that really, guys, is what CAD seems like to me. It's, it's a play that Quackle finds that, like, I know I would never find in a game. I don't know how many humans would find this and be able to calculate it precisely, but it's just, to me, like a classic example of a computer line. Like, it's just remarkable that Quackle found it. But that is not the end of this video. Like I said, Cad, according to Quackle, was the only move that could have tied for David in this original position, where once again, he decided to play Aga and Ab on the bottom, which resulted in a one-point win for me in the game. However, the story is not over here. It turns out that there is a superior engine to Quackle, namely Cesar del Solar's Macondo engine. And when we plugged this position into Macondo, Macondo found not only one, but two different plays for David that do not tie but win this game by a single point. But before I talk about those plays, I want to first address a couple other plays you guys might have been wondering about, and at least to me, seem much more obvious as candidate plays over the board, namely playing Chat or Chad from the Sea and Crispus. For instance, Chad seems like a very logical play. David scores 18 points, which is quite a lot for this board. He takes a lead, and he threatens to go out with Ajita or Taiga to the A in Chad. The problem with Chad is it allows me to simply play the word elude through this D for 12 points. And it looks kind of dangerous, but I'm not actually giving David any outs. There is nowhere to play gate, and there are no fives through the E or the L, and I've blocked Taiga and Agita. I have an A and an E, so I'm going to be able to play out next turn in one of several spots. And it turns out David doesn't have any ways to win here. His best play here would be Git for 12 points, and now I'm only down one, so I can go out anywhere that's valid with my A and my E and win this game. My best outplay would be O over here for 10, winning the game 399 to 388. So that disposes of Chad. Now let's go back and see, instead of Chad, what happens if David plays Chad. 
And this actually causes me some more problems. I can still win, but there are only two ways to do so, and they're both pretty counterintuitive and tricky to find. The best play is to simply play Ute through the T in chat for three points. The idea is I set up a Lee and the Loot down the D column for an outplay on my next turn. And the crazy thing is there's actually no way for David to block me from going out without giving me another outplay. For instance, if he plays Da over here, which does block a Lee and Loot, I can simply go out with a Lee and Ed on the triple and of course win easily. His best play, it turns out, would be to play Doug through this U, which does block a Lee with Loot, but I can still play a Lee with Ag now over here, and that will still be enough points to win because now I'm down two, but after I get four more points from David's unplayed A and I, I'd win the game 390 to 388. So you would be one way I could win again, very difficult to see. The other way to win is possibly even more counterintuitive. It's Eel over here for eight points. And the reason this is so counterintuitive is it seems to simply open a massive hotspot for David to use that double word score next to the ET. And he does have a G that can go there and he can score a lot of points with it. The thing is, with Eel, I'm actually setting up two outs for myself because I have O on my rack, E-A-U, and I can now play that next to the L and Eel, and I can also play it over here next to the A and T in chat, forming A, E, and Edda. David cannot block both of these. If he tries to go for maximum points with Dig and Get, then I go out with O over here, now making the valid four of Getta, and I would win by four, 397 to 393. Turns out David's best option is to sacrifice a couple of points after Eel by playing Dag over here for 15 instead of the 18 points for Dig or Dag in the other spot. Now he blocks my higher scoring out, but I can still go out with O and L, and that will be enough barely, as now after I get the two bonus points from David's unplayed eye, I win by a single point, 391 to 390. So after chat, I absolutely must find either Ute or Eel to win the game. So certainly doable, but also certainly very tricky. But in any case, that establishes why Chat and Chad do not win this game for David. So let's now go back to the original position and finally, once and for all, reveal the two plays, the only two plays that would have allowed David to win in this incredible starting position. Now, before I jump in, I suppose I should give the viewers a chance to pause the video and see if you can come up with either or both of David's winning sequences here. Uh, now, for anybody who actually finds these moves and sees the whole sequence all the way through, major, major kudos. Like I mentioned, this completely stumped Quackle, which is one of the leading Scrabble programs and uh, certainly a great endgame solver. And yeah, it's just absolutely incredible. I don't know how someone would actually see all this over the board. But in any case, one of the two moves for David that wins is playing the word Sig from this G for eight points. And this is kind of similar to Cad. It doesn't really seem to have an obvious threat. With AADHT, David is not threatening to go out. And it gives back a little less counterplay than CAD because SIG doesn't take any hooks other than an S, but it still gives me back a decent amount of counterplay without really seeming to have much of an idea for David. So what is the plan behind SIG? Well, one thing to notice is anything I do paralleling SIG is going to give way too much back to David. For instance, my most obvious play is probably a Lee and Ag since it scores 11 points and gets rid of four of my six tiles. The problem is it gives David very large plays down the D column. For instance, if he just responds with Da for 28, that's going to be more than enough for him to win. He's up eight points. I can't go out here, and he's playing out pretty easily on his next turn. So it's not hard to see that David is comfortably winning after a Lee. And there really isn't much else for me to do on the left-hand side of the board that is productive and doesn't give anything back to David. So my best play here, it turns out by quite a large margin, is to just drop my U for 14 points and kind of stall and see what David has in mind next. And it turns out that David has once again only a single move that wins the game. And it's very hard to see. It is simply dropping the H over here with SH and Heth for 15 points. The idea behind this play is actually not all that hard to see. It's saving Data and Ab on the 14 row here as a threat to play out. Now you might be wondering, okay, what about just playing Data first? Because that plays off more tiles and it's probably easier to play an H in multiple spots whereas I can probably block Data. Well, the problem is if... David plays Data, he's simply not getting enough points. If he plays Data, then I'm just going to respond with a Lee over here for 11, and he will be able to go out with his H on his next turn with SH and Hef, but he's going to fall six points short when the game is over. So that's why he has to play SH first, saving Data. And now you might be like, okay, well, why don't I just play a Lee anyway and let him go out with Data, since this is basically just a transposition of the sequence I just showed you, and I won by six. Well, the problem is now... If I play a Lee, I give him an even higher scoring spot for Data over here, making four overlaps. 
And this scores 23 points, and that would result in a six-point win for David. So I now can't play Elite. And the problem is there's no other play I can make on the left, really, that doesn't give David a higher scoring spot for data. L has the same problem, and other plays simply just don't score enough points to outrun data. I can also just completely ignore the spot on the top left and play R down here on the bottom right, but this also falls just short because now David goes out with data here as planned, and after getting six bonus points for my unplayed tiles, he wins the game by one point, 398 to 397. So... Going back, I really don't have a choice but to block Data. The most logical way for me to block Data and Ab is to play Lee over here for 9 points. Now you might think, okay, well this doesn't really block Data because David can now just play it over here, making Law. The thing is though, this scores fewer points than Data and Ab, and this is going to fall short for him because after this game ends, I'm going to win by 5, 398 to 393. So going back, David cannot win this game by going out, but he can still win. And the way he wins is truly mind-blowing. He wins this game by sticking me with an unplayable E. Let me let that sink in for a moment. David wins this game by E-sticking me. Now, you've probably seen situations, if you've been watching or playing Scrabble long enough, where someone gets stuck with an unplayable tile like a Q or a V. That happens pretty often because there are no two other words with a V, and the only two with a Q is QI. So it's pretty easy to get stuck with tiles like that. Even U's are fairly easy to get stuck with relative to all the other vowels because there are comparatively few two-letter words. But E's are some of the most flexible tiles in the game, and for someone to be stuck with an E where it doesn't go anywhere, not even one spot on the entire board, is pretty much unconscionable. I don't know if I've ever even seen another game, let alone been involved in another game, where that has been a factor. But that's exactly what happens here. And you might think, well, okay, I actually do have a couple spots on this board where I can play an E. I can play one next to the M and Trireme over here, and I can also play one next to the R and Jumars at the bottom right over here. But the thing is, I have two E's, and it's David's turn. So if he blocks one of the spots, and I'm forced to use the other spot, then I'm going to have no spots remaining. Let me show you how this works. David responds with Am for five points. My only play is to play Re for two. And now I'm still up 14 points, but I now have an E left, and I have absolutely nowhere legal to play it. So now David is in no rush to go out since I'm just going to have to keep passing so he can take his time at playing out as slowly as possible to garner more points. And that's exactly what he would do here. He would, in some sequence, it doesn't actually matter the order, play can for eight points. I, of course, have to pass because I can't play my E. He then responds with diff for seven points. I, of course, have to pass again. I still can't play my E. And finally, David goes out with it and toot for six points and ends up winning the game by nine, 409 to 400. So just truly remarkable stuff, guys. Once again, his only path to victory in that scenario is to e-stick me. So going back to the position where David played Heth, since I just lost by nine in the variation where I showed where I allowed him to e-stick me, what I should actually do is ignore the bottom and ignore the top left and to play R over here allow him to go out with data, which as we saw before, results in a one point victory for David. So that is how SIG results in a one point win for David with optimal play. Now, going back to the original position, I mentioned that there are two plays that win for David by one point. And the other play is actually very similar. Well, it doesn't look similar at first, but I think you guys will see why it's similar. It's playing SH and Heth first. And it actually transposes into the same exact sequence as SIG. The thing is, there's nothing that I can do from the C and Crispist that doesn't give David even more counterplay. For instance, if I try to play Q over there for 7, setting up A, E, and a Lee next turn, then David has several ways to win. The best one is to play Q'd and Dit for 12 with the idea of setting up Aga, A, G, A, in two spots. One with a Dit on the E column and the other on the bottom in a spot we've looked at several times before with Ab. And I can't block both of these, and I can't score enough to outrun him. My best play would be something like Eel and Edit, and then David goes out on the bottom and wins the game by 4 points, 397 to 393. And there are several other plays I could make from the C, but it's not too hard to see that they fare no better than Q. Another option for me, instead of just playing Your over here for 14, which of course we know will lose for me, because David now just plays Sig, and that transposes into the exact variation we were looking at before, so I won't go into detail on this, Instead of your something else I maybe could try is just playing R over here on the bottom right for 8 points. And the idea with this is that if David now responds with Sig, 
Once again, threatening data, I can actually block even without an A because I now have my U and I can drop it here with N, U, and up for six points. And that stops data. However, the problem is David can again win by going into the same idea as before, dropping his A over here with AM for five points. Now, this time I'm not E stuck because I do have my L. But the problem is anywhere I play, I'll be giving David a good outplay. Once again, if I play Lev for eight points, then David gets Tad over here for 15, winning easily 403 to 397. And there's really nothing else for me to do in this position other than play Lev. If I play leg to this G, that gives David Tad under the L and E and leg for a lot of points. And the other thing I can try, which is actually a little bit more troublesome, is lay for three points, which does stop David from going out. It's worth mentioning that if I tried to pass or something here, then David could also just go out on the E column with Tad making T-I and A-G. So I could try L-E-I over here. However, David has a win, and it is once again staking me with my unplayable E. There's only one way to do it, and it is la for two points. After this play, there is nowhere whatsoever for me to play my E. I have to pass, and now David will play off his D and T in succession. And you have to be a little bit careful, right? You don't want to just play lad first, because that allows me to go out with my E, with laid, and win the game. So David needs to be a little careful. He should just play toot over here first. Uh, diff is also fine if he wants to this... Uh, to this IF over here first. He just needs to be a little bit mindful of the sequence to not give me an out on the first play. But yeah, something like two here is totally fine. I have to pass. And now David goes out with Lad for eight points and wins this game quite easily. So once again, uh, David does still have a win if, if I try to play R on the bottom right in this position here instead of going into the known variation we looked at before with your, but he does have to be a little bit careful and still properly execute an e-stick in that variation as well. It is worth mentioning a probably more straightforward way for David to rebut R is not to go into the sig line, but to simply play Taiga on the bottom here, offloading five of his tiles, just holding a D. He goes up two points, and with a D, he's going to have several places to go out. My best play would just be your for 14 points, now David plays Deuce for 8 and would go on after getting 6 points from my rack to win the game by 2, 399 to 397. So a little bit more straightforward probably than Sig is, so he doesn't have to go into that complicated E-stick line. But in any case, the main point is that uh, instead of playing Sig to start, David can play Heth, and there's nothing I can do here. Because once again, if I play from the C, I give him counterplay. If I play R on the bottom right, he either plays Sig anyway and E-sticks me or plays Taiga on the bottom. And of course, if he plays Yor once again, we go into that same E-stick line that we saw before with Sig. So yeah, that pretty much wraps it up, guys. Once again, in this original position, David played Aga on the bottom. I ended up winning by one. He has a tie with Cad that Quackle finds. And he has two wins that Quackle does not find, but Makondo finds, namely... Sig or Heth, both of which have similar ideas of potentially E-sticking me to win the game. David cannot win this game if he does not see an E-stick in at least some variation, which is, again, just truly remarkable. I mean, how many of you have ever seen a game, let alone been involved in a game where an E-stick was relevant to the result? I, like I said, have definitely never seen that happen. If any of you have any other instances you know of where somebody was e-stuck or stuck with another tile that seems similarly hard to get stuck with, I would love to see them. I love these kind of end games. They are so fascinating and so hard to solve. I mean, like I said, I don't know how a human, even if you had like the full 25 minutes on your clock, I don't know how you see all this. It's just absolutely incredible. Like it took me hours just to comprehend all of this going through with the computers and making this video. It is truly insane, remarkable stuff. And that's, I think, what's so cool about Scrabble and makes it kind of like chess, especially the end games. It is solvable in the end game by an exhaustive computer like we saw with Macondo. But being able to solve it as a human and iterate through all these possibilities and find plays like CAD or SIG that they just don't even really seem to have a purpose or a threat at first, but just have these long-term plans that don't give anything back to your opponent or create these traps like e-sticking them. It's, it's just so cool. And that's part of what I love about the game. So I hope you guys really enjoyed this video and maybe picked up a couple of new uh, end game tips. And uh, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that, guys. This video is already over half hour long. And I still feel like I haven't completely exhausted the complexities and intricacies of this end game. So 
Crazy stuff. Really hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you soon for the next one. Bye-bye.